Alrighty, so I have got a huge guest with me on Fat Chat today. Quite literally so huge. I had to bring these lenses out to fit his head in. He's just so tall. I'm so excited to have him. He played 200 games for St Kilda, 247 snags. You beauty, how good's that? A 2001 Rising Star winner uh, and uh, part of uh, some very successful teams with St Kilda. Please welcome Justin Kaziski. Thank you very much for having me. And I, uh, I just quite liked how you got your dad... Just working behind oh, him. And, you, and you just called him Big Fella. Yeah, Big Fella. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Right. He's the Big Fella. The gun, big fella. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was... call my dad Big Fella, he'd probably knock me out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, mate, I had uh, Stephen Baker on uh, the other day and he was telling some of the stories back in the Saints days uh, that you were part of the same era that, were, that there were some awesome stories there. So I can't wait to hear um, all the amazing uh, ones that you've got as well, um, which, which are going to be really good. So for someone that, you know, maybe hadn't watched you play football, how would you describe your career? Ah, well, that's a good question. You don't really get get asked that. I think uh, I had a solid career without being a star. Um, I cringe at the fact that when people like introduce you as a star, like I, I thought I was uh, I was oh, an average rising, player, rising star though. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. But uh, as far as an AFL career goes, um, you know, I probably underachieved. I wasn't mentally quite there to to get the most out of myself. Yeah. Um, you know, be an elite preparer, and I think. In any sport and in anything you do, the elite preparers, the elite trainers get the most rewards. So, yep. you know, I wasn't certainly one in the category of a Lenny Hayes or a Nick Rewald who I played with who yep. were elite preparers. Um, you know, looking back on it, hindsight's a great thing and I, I di- realised that late that I wasn't uh, wasn't in that category. So, you know, I, I had a solid career. Um and, and played in some great teams and very grateful for it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the uh, core memories that I've got of you playing, so this was 2009 this was, uh, and I'm really into footy cards, right? So it was first day that the new footy cards came out would have been, I don't know, 12 or something. Went down to the news agent. You were 12 and 09? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, 13 maybe. It's yeah. amazing how, how old you feel straight away. It's like, well, I did a podcast with Saints TV the other day and, um, Some of the young fellas there, the young blokes there, like they're good. They're good. They're having a crack, but they weren't born when I started. Yes, yeah, like, yeah. Bringing things up. I'm yeah. Like, so what the wow. fuck? <laughs> anyway, sorry. So anyway, first pack of footy cards. I pick. I get this pack out, and I feel this thing in the pack, and I'm like, oh, what's that? And I open it up, and th- this was like the best card you could get. It was a Nick Rewalt, Justin Kaczynski called Double Trouble card. So you're both on the same card, right? One in every three boxes. Fucking hard to get. Super wow. rare, right? But. I worked out that you could the the back of the card for that year was actually turned around, and because it was like a, this plastic, you could feel the edge of the card that it was the good one. Right. So then that was the first pack. So that year, I just go to the news agent, rub oh, all the corners. You got the inside every single time. I'd be pulling the best I ones. That's efficiency, right? That is. So I've actually got a few of them. I'll yeah. say I'm going to send you one. I'm yeah, going to send you one. Seen that I'm going to send you one. It's a really really nice well, card. It's an honor to be on the same card as that bloke. So yeah, absolutely. I always said you know, even when I was playing with Nick. I'd always said that I'd tell my grandkids that I played with Nick Rewalt. Yep. Like I knew that they were, he was a once-in-a-generation player. So to be on a card with him is pretty cool. Pretty cool. I'll send one to you. So let's go back uh, to uh, the start of your journey. Can you tell us a little bit about you growing up, um, You know where you grew up, about your family, and how you got into football? Yeah. Um, grew up on a wheat farm. Yep. Uh, country New South Wales, southern New South Wales. So um, isolated. Grew up with three brothers, mum and dad on the farm, yep. um, family farming business. Are they still down yeah, their farm? Yeah, the still spot? going. Yeah. Um, mum and dad are still living on the farm. My brother my brother runs it, yep. middle brother. My other brother is um, is uh, works for elders, stock yep. agent. So he's up at Narandra, so he's closely tied to the farm. Very – an amazing childhood. Like I would not wish for anything better, you know, like hard, good morals, work ethic, um, you know, outdoors – we sport in the local town, you know, it was footy in the winter, cricket in the summer. Uh, went to school, a primary school, Brocklesby, that had 30 kids from yep. kinder to year six. Unreal. You know, so... <laughs> That's like... Four, you know, f- four kids in my grade the whole way wow. through primary school and then went down to Coral to high school, uh, which was an eye-opener. You know, 30 kids in a primary school and then... Going into a bigger pool of people. Yeah, then 100 kids in year seven. Yeah. So I was like, whoa, you know, and there was girls... Yeah, you know, unreal. That's girls. Yeah. Uh, wow. there's, a, there's a scene you know, in between. You know, at that stage, you, <laughs> yeah. when you're 13, all of a sudden it's like a bull in a new paddock. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, that was pretty cool. <laughs> that is cool. Um, you know, and high school was a. You know, I wasn't good at school. You know, I only went to school to eat my lunch, really. Yep, and play footy and, and play footy recess. and um, and socialise. Yep. But yeah, you know, I met some great mates uh, through high school and still get still really close to a couple of those blokes. And yep. And how did you actually get into football? Was your dad uh, into sports? Did you play any other sports growing up? 
Um, yeah, dad was uh, dad's a three hundred game local legend mm. at Brocklesby. Uh, so unbelievable. You know, he grew up with it. Grew up going to footy training and sitting on his knee in the in the change rooms at half time after a game for the Brock Roos. Unreal. And, you know, it was sort of um, it was in the DNA. Yep. Uh, and 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 that was that was that was your social life, right? In a little community. Yep. Um, cricket in the summer and footy in the winter, and you know, and the netball and there was a tennis club and uh, and the like. And that was everybody's social activity. Like that was your Saturday for my whole childhood. Was was going to the footy and you know into the rooms after the game and down to the pub playing in the park while the while the while the dads always had felt a beer really and, part of it. Yeah, yeah, it was so played. Uh, we we didn't have many players. We had. Uh, we only had three grades. We had a senior side, a reserves, and an under 14s. And you were playing seniors when you were five years old, probably. Well, I was they- under, <laughs> under, under 14 when I was nine. Yeah. You know, for, for five years, 14, and then straight into the seniors. So Great. Um, I, I learned, I think, how to mix it with bigger bodies and, and men early, which probably held me in good stead later Raised on. your skill level up just that little bit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then who was, like, your first, uh, I guess, like, proper league team that you played for? Was there any, like... Uh, rep footy that you played, anything yeah, like nah, that? Yeah, I was, I was a late, I was a late developer. Yep. Um, yeah, it was just I was playing senior footy at Brock when I was fifteen, sixteen. Uh, grew. I played on a wing when I was fifteen, and then a ruck when I was sixteen. Right. So the next year, <laughs> um, you know, and and always would have loved, obviously, to play AFL footy, but just didn't think it was really achievable. And yep. then, um, you know, I didn't even make the Murray Bush Rangers squad as a bottom age player. Yep. And, and played footy out in the bush. And then they sort of the, the letter came, the, they knocked the door down to say, you know, you need to try out for this. And I just thought I'll, I'll give it a go. Yep. Um, you know, and then one year, one year really at, of rep footy. Yeah, right. Uh, Murray Bush Rangers and played in the carnival and for New South Wales and was all Australian. And I think that that was a period that middle, middle, the Australian carnival was like, I think uh, I think I'm good enough to, to be in the mix here. Absolutely. So then, how did it come about you going to the draft? Because you ended up pick number two for uh, what a 2000 draft. In the 2000. Yep. 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 So how did that all come about? Was there other teams that were interested? Did you know that Saints were you know keen? Um, yeah, it's it's geez, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, was, I think all Australian that year, and then was invited to the draft camp. The manager was was a thing. The managers started knocking, and yep. letters kept coming. And they were going to John Byrne, who was the manager of the Murray Bush Rangers. Yeah, I think he kept us a little bit sheltered from it, which gotcha. was great. Like, so you just didn't get out of, um, get a big head over. Because there must have been like a massive influx if you're going so high in the draft. There would have been so yeah, many people. But I didn't. I don't think I realised that. Yep. I didn't realise the enormity of it uh, that year, and just went about playing footy. And then the end of the year comes, you get invited to the draft camp. You get interviewed by clubs and. Um, yeah, I went to the draft camp and only four clubs interviewed, and I'm like, "What's going on here?" Like, yeah. but but they were the sort of the clubs that were that had high picks in the draft. So, um, well, the other ones know. probably didn't even want to bother talking to you because you've got to get taken. Yeah, but so I didn't realise that right yeah. at the time. It's just like, yeah, whatever. Um, so I remember talking to St Kilda, Collingwood, and, and West Coast. I think had the, mm-hmm. the, the top few picks, and um, I think at that stage, and, and Nick was there. Yep. So Nick and I sort of formed a bit of a bond. That was the, going to be one of my next questions, yeah, was you and Nick were in the same draft. So how did the, how did you first meet uh, Nick? Well, I think we formally met at, at the draft camp. Yep. It, was, it was a funny story. In the, that year, the under-18s, we were playing in Division 2. He was Queensland, I was New South Wales. Yep. And we played our first game of the Carnival at, at Optus Oval at Princess Park, whatever yep. it is now. Um, and we are both playing centre forward for each team, New South and, and Queensland. And I think... You know, we we're both having a good game, and by three quarter time, I think Rue had taken fifteen marks or something ridiculous. And Rod Carter was our coach, and he just goes to me and he goes, "Mate, you're going to have to go and play on him. He's, gonna, <laughs> he's ripping us apart." And I'm playing enough for yeah, it, and I'm going playing okay good. Myself. Yeah, like, leave me alone. Might have taken ten myself. Yeah, and kicked a couple. He goes, "No, you're going to have to go play on him." So I played on him as center at center half back. Wow! Uh, in that last quarter, I think. We How did up, you go? Yeah, okay. Um, we ended up winning, and then so that was my first interaction with him. Um, and then we formally met at the draft camp, and I think you know there was we the whisper, and we had a little bit of an inkling that we we're going to go to the same club, and um, so we formed a pretty good bond pretty quick. That's awesome. And then the coach at the time for St Kilda, who was that? Uh, it was Tim Watson. Uh, was at the end of at the end of two thousand, but he he got uh, he got his marching orders, and they just appointed Malcolm Blight. Yep. So they went and uh, they threw the checkbook at Blighty to come out of retirement yep. and coach the Saints. So he was our first coach. It was how, um, how, what was he like as a coach? Well, yeah, he. I think he. Yeah, he was definitely appointed by the time the draft came around. So yep. I met him draft day. 
um, you know, and from for both of us, I guess, a, a kid from the Gold Coast and country kid from New South Wales looking at Malcolm Blight, who had coached back to back flags yeah. three years ago or two years ago at the Crows, were like, Wow, how good is this to have Malcolm Bly as our first mentor? Yeah. Um, which was pretty surreal. That's unreal. So then rocking up to Saints first day, who were like the big dogs that you were trying to impress? Like who were the other stars on the team at the time? Yeah, I don't know about trying to impress, but I think every kid goes through it. You rock it up an AFL club and you're like, what the hell am I doing here? Yep. You know, do I deserve to be here? You feel like an intruder, an imposter, and you're like, how am I going to mix it with these guys? But, um, you know, we – obviously the guys at the time was, was Rob Harvey had won – Back to back Brownlows, uh, 97, 98. Yep. You know, he's still at the peak of his career. Stewie Lowe was a big figure. Barry Hall was there, Spider Everett. Yep. And then, you know, the, the two guys that probably had the most influence on my career or on me, probably as a person as well. Mm. And a, a lot of our era was Fraser Garrick and Aaron Hamill. Yep. So the Saints had gone really aggressive that year. Uh, you know, Nick and I in the draft. And then they traded really aggressively. They knew they needed that quality, yep. and they got Garrick and, and Hamill, both from really strong teams in the 90s. Garrick was in – was at West Coast, eh? He was at the yeah. Eagles, yeah, for probably four, six or seven years maybe. Yeah. Um, and then – and Aaron was uh, – come out of Carlton, and yep. they were both mid-20s and probably ready to explode and, and in their career and had amazing work ethics and great people. And, you know, Fraze – I never met Fraze, but we had a geographical connection because he's from Wodonga. Oh, right. There you, you know, go. Really close to where I grew up, or yep. Wodonga. Um, so he sort of took me under his wing and um, taught me, I, I think, how to prepare and how to, as a person, really. Like, you'll never meet a kinder, more generous person than Fraze. But, you know, with a bit of mongrel in him, great competitor. Sure. So <laughs> between him and Sammy, that was uh, we were really fortunate to have those guys as mentors in our first year. Definitely. And then do you have any stories from early on Saints where like either maybe when your first games were coming out, did you get stitched up by any teammates early on, like being the, the new kid or? Um, I, I don't know about stitch, kind of stitch up in a way because it, and it was it was cool, but we the boys were planning, like they're talking about footy trips, right? Yep. And, you know, I was a lad, loved the beer, come from the country, but really, Melbourne was a big experience for me. And all of a sudden, I was hearing about this Thailand footy trip and all these cool <laughs> things that were going on. I'm like, this is going to be amazing. You know, I didn't have a passport. Yeah. You know, we're going to go on that. And then halfway through the year, Tomo, Grant Thomas, who took over as coach after round 15, because Blighty got the sack. Yep. And Tomo took over and he's like, got wind of the footy trip, I think. And he's like, you blokes are fucking kidding yourselves. Why would you go? We're going to finish last or second last or something. Why would you go, get on the piss and celebrate mediocrity, you know, and actually go slap each other on the back, go away on this holiday when you come second last? Wouldn't you rather just dig in and try and do it and then actually celebrate each other when you get good? Yep. Which was an amazing call. Yep. You know, and, it, and um, you know, which, which happened. I was devastated. <laughs> Are you kidding? Going, no. Like my first year in the <laughs> AFL. I'm not I've just a, ordered the passport. I'm going. not having a footy trip. And anyway, so I think Tom, I knew about it, but everyone thought he didn't. But there was all these little rogue trips that accidentally we'd go away and uh, <laughs> but, just go but, just go missing but for a bit. Fraze, Fraze had been to Bali, you know, a lot of times, and, and Stevie Lawrence it was. He grabbed Nick and I and he said, Are you coming to Bali with us? And I'm like, right, this is pretty cool. So. I said, I don't have a passport. So he put me in the car, go into the city. He paid paid the money for me to get a quick passport. Unreal. And the next day, he said, pack your toothbrush, pair of boardies and a backpack. Don't worry about anything else. <laughs> um, picked us up and went to the airport and, um, you know, literally one set of clothes, a toothbrush and a passport and a backpack, a pair of thongs. And we went to Bali and that was, uh, that was a pretty good eye. Yeah, be sure, I imagine. <laughs> Just cruising around Bali. Like ne Melbourne was a big deal, you know? Yeah, so, I that was totally so we different. So to Bali with Fraser and Stevie Lawrence and Nick and I were uh, a bit, bit starry-eyed and we, we got up to a bit of mischief. I bet. <laughs> That's awesome. So then your first season with the Saints, you personally had a fantastic year. You won the Rising Star 2001. You played like 20 games or something like that, which is a whole heap for um, you know a first-year player coming on in. Yep. Tell us about that year personally for you. Yeah, it was a bit accidental really. Uh, I won it playing centre-half back and it really been a forward or a ruckman yep. really my whole junior career and was dr was drafted in those positions and um i remember um might have been a practice game early on i'm not sure and blighty played me at center half forward and just it was like you know I, the, it went on i don't think i did really well and we come off and then a couple of days later he's like how'd you find that and i said oh yeah it's all right and he goes 
Oh, I just chucked you there just to see if I had a real star on my hands. <laughs> um, and he goes, but I haven't. So oh! Kate Lurkin <laughs> was just proper brutal. That backhand just like, I think like Jonathan Brown had come on the scene 12 months or two years But I think it might have been that. He goes, I just wanted to see if I had another Jonathan Brown on my hands, <laughs> but I haven't. <laughs> um, oh, so bang. And then um, we were playing – we were playing – was my second game. We were playing Port Adelaide – in Adelaide. Yep. Um, and Blighty was trying to turn Barry Hall into a centre-half back. Mm-hmm. Played him there the first couple of games. And and Baz lined up on Treadray. He was probably the best player best player in Australia at the time. Like, mid-20s, was fit as a Gun. bull. Yep. Was all over the place. And, and he and he tore Baz apart in the first quarter. Um, you know, it took six or eight marks or something. And I'd spent the first quarter on the bench. Like, back in the days where it's like you actually spend some time yep. on the bench. So I had the jacket on. <laughs> Out at quarter time, cold night, footy park. You know, sitting there, probably pretty stiff, yeah. not ready to go. And, <laughs> and Blighty's coming out there and he's like, Baz, you're not a backman, go back forward. And he's just looking around, he's looking around, and he just points <laughs> at me and goes, you, you're on Treadre. Like, my ass puckered hard. <laughs> Sat on the bench for the first quarter, go out and play on Treadre. No. Like, oh. And, you know, that was my first experience as a backman. Wow, so, wow. Just uh, sink or, uh, yeah. sink or and swim. Yeah, it was a massive eye opener. Like, oh, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm – Young and I'm fit and whatever, and he's a big guy. I'll be able to keep up with him, but it was just an eye opener to how hard an elite forward worked. What that next level I just was. Could not yeah. believe that he was on the back flank and then he'd be in the goal square and then he'd be on the back flank again and then the goal square and just ran me ragged, you know. And I must have done okay because I stayed stayed there for the rest of the year. And then every every week after that, it was like I was getting assigned the centre half forward yep. for the year. And, and they just, just gun, gun, you know, after gun after gun after yeah, gun. Yeah, and it on. was an amazing. You know, I played on David Swartz and. and Johnny Brown, who was young, but had some good battles with him, and um, you know these type of players, and it exposed me to um, to to being raising that level up. Yeah, I don't think that hold me instead later to, to be a forward. So learn the craft of of that, and stayed there and did okay. Absolutely. So then, like after that first year, which you came out absolutely steaming, was awesome. The next few years after that, you a little bit in and out because of injuries. Yeah. Tell us about that and what that was sort of like for you, I guess, like mentally and also physically, the stuff that you were like doing throughout that period to get yourself back. Yeah, I think um, sports science was, you know, not as good as it was mm. back then. And, you know, I was a really skinny kid, you know, like a like a little willow yeah. in, the, in the wind. So I think I was only 80, 85, 87 kilos, ring and wet. Yeah. Um, How tall are you? 6'6"? 6'5". 6'5", yeah. Um, and then that... that First year, tw- first preseason, twenty games, playing as a centre half back. It was a big year physically. Yep. Um, and then the goal was, I think, over the next preseason, is to put on as much weight as I could, so I could mix it with these guys, like strength wise, mm. or, or start being able to mix it. Um, you know, I put six or eight kilos on over summer, and my back just started like I felt like I was cramps, and I pushed through it and pushed through it, and played the first four really uncomfortably, and and it worked out that I had a stress fracture in my low back. Ugh. Um, you know, round four, and that and that was it. So and was that played, just from just so much load that you were doing so. in terms of training? I think training? it was just yeah. like on the on the back of being a teenager and growing, yep. and trying to put weight on and the workload, and yep. you know maybe not being managed right. Um, it just that was that was a byproduct of it. So I learnt that the you know the ups of the rising star and the two thousand and one season and the downs, basically watching on um, with something that. Was it wasn't like a broken leg or a broken ankle that you could go okay this this is yeah yeah I had a stress fracture in my back that really took some managing and you know some professionalism to manage it yep. um you know no one could really tell me when I could play again like mm-hmm. it's not a four week injury or a six week but it, it ended up being the whole year so um yeah by the end of my second year I'd, I'd experienced both ends of the playing spectrum absolutely so then what did you change in terms of your preparation and mindset and that sort of thing from like you said sort of cruising not cruising on through but having this big high uh, of the first year and then you're getting sort of really slapped back down to reality a little bit what did you change with your preparation and leading up and taking care of your body early on yeah I think it was a good lesson because I, I came in really raw and and hadn't had that like nowadays the academies and the tack cups and you know these the preparation that the kids go through now to be a professional player you know when i was 16 i was drinking six cans in the rooms after the game <laughs> so with yeah. the senior boys it was a out, different right. time yeah you know and i can remember going to the bush rangers and they're all in tights and drinking power and i'm like i don't, I don't want a part of this yeah but, yeah you know that was a little bit of a insight to it and then you know just to walk in first year and 
you know, I was fortunate enough as well because we had a really poor list, bottom of the ladder, and that gave me the opportunity to play senior footy straight up. And that was sort of a blur. And then all of a sudden hit with a debilitating injury that literally couldn't run. Yep. Um, or lift weights or do anything because, of, you know, your back carries a lot of the load. It's amazing how much you, like, when somebody does a back injury, you're yeah. completely immobilised yeah. from doing and I, everything. I remember just even, you know, the boys would be going to the movies or something, yep. and, but I couldn't sit for two hours, Yep. right? So I think I went with them once and laid down in the aisle because oh. I had to lay down, but I got kicked out because it's an emergency thoroughfare oh, or whatever. I'm like, I can't even go to the movies with the guys. So. Yep. It did teach me to manage it and probably appreciate fitness yep. um, and what you have and when you've got it. So, as I said, it was it was a really good balance up between the first two years. Absolutely. So then once you're getting back into the side, you've sort of got over the stress fractures. There was a few years there where it was a little bit in and out for you with various injuries. You start. When did you start actually playing ruck and going a little bit more forward? Um, I think 03 or 04. Tomo, Tomo had a real different theory as 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 far as a ruckman goes yep uh he wasn't um he wasn't sold on the traditional big six foot eight 105 kilo ruckman yep um he he sort of had a theory that a smaller more agile guy could could add a bit more weight to it I, he just wasn't a fan of the hit out you mm-hmm. know like if we had the midfield and the game plan and the attitude i guess so that gave me the chance to play in the ruck and i'd done a little bit when i was a kid um, which I'm really grateful for because I love doing it. It gets you amongst the game. And, you know, blokes like Jason Blake played in the ruck. He carried a lot of the ruck load. Yep. Um, and he's a couple inches shorter than me So and was highly competitive. So, um, yeah, got the chance to play in the ruck pretty early, 03, 04, 05, I reckon, as a, as a ruck forward. Yep. And then out of all the eras that you play, all the years, sorry, uh, who's your hardest player that you've had to match up on? Was there some that you would – whether it was when you had centre-half back early on or up yeah. forward or ruck or – Yeah, I, like I mentioned Warren Treadray before. I got the experience to play on him as a backman yeah. when he was at the top of his game um, when I was 18-year-old kid and starry-eyed and that was it was a good lesson. Um, a couple of good, as a backman, a couple of good battles with Johnny Brown over the years. Any of them really good on like the lip or anything with nah. you? Or give you any of the old little nah, tactics? Nah. nah, nah, not really. Nah, I, I, I guess I just didn't believe that I was going well enough to give lip. Yeah, you know? like if you if you're lipping off and you and you're not flying. Like any any spell. giving it back to you, going, oh, young fella, did you see that one? Did you see this goal I got or yeah, anything like that? Yeah, the Lions were really good at it. Yeah. Early days, when we sort of come of age, 04, 05, when we started playing deep into the finals, the Lions were, were a tough, brutal, verbal, physical team. I remember getting some uh, – playing the final up there, 04, to kick the final series off. They were first and we were fourth, you know, and they were the – Oh, the big kid on the block and yep. some of the stuff that I was saying was pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't like funny stuff. It was just oh, like, nah. it was just hard. Nah, yeah, mate, yeah. you think about Mal Michael and... Um, Michael Voss. Pike. Yeah. yeah. Pike, he was brutal on the on the lip. And uh, Justin Lepich and the Scott brothers. Like, yep. That was their back line. Yep. You know? And, Fierce, and Sammy yeah. Hamill and, and the Scott boys would be going at each other and Lepper would be playing on Rue as a young kid and Mal Michael would be playing on Fraser Gary. Like, it was a pretty, it was a pretty cool thing to watch. To witness. Definitely. Um, and then the coaches that you played for, so it was Grant Thomas, Tim Watson early, Malcolm Blight. I didn't play for Tim. Oh, you didn't play for Tim? So Tim Oh, that finished, was that, that yeah, year. Yeah, and then Blighty came that Took year. Took over, yeah. yeah. And then Ross Lyon as well. Yeah. You must have some good stories from one of the coaches. Did you get with receiving any of any sprays from Ross or from uh, from Blighty? You mentioned a great one before. Yeah, yeah, Blighty gave it to me, Deluxe. But, you know, I didn't, deluxe. <laughs> I didn't know. So he finished 15, year, 15 weeks into my career. Yep. Um. And as a kid, you know, you're not privy to what's going on behind the scenes. That's your first experience. I didn't really understand what was what was happening. So, you know, not really. He didn't have the chance to have an impact on me, really blighty. Um, and then Tomo came along and was influential in our, in our culture, in building our list, in giving us life experience, a really amazing mentor for us as young kids, um, and probably set that era up, you know, and, and coached a great team. Mm. You know, prelims in 04 and five, 04 and 05, you know, in a final series in 06. And then, you know, he got the raspberries after that. But um, he was huge. And then he, I think he set a great culture and a team up for Ross Lyon. is very meth- methodical. And as, yep. a, as a first year senior coach, like Ross, he's only, I think he was only 39 or 40 wow. when he started. Like he's my age now. And I yep. think of myself taking on a senior team. Like, no chance. That's full so, on, yeah. You know, Rossi um, took over a, a pretty established list. Um, and added his own twist on it and real methodical game plan and um, amazing motivator, Rossi. You know, if, <laughs> it's it's really simple, right? If you give him 100%, he'll back you the whole way. Yep. You know, it's act your way in, act your way out. But 
if you didn't look out, like yeah, I'd for hate sure. to be on the other side of Rossi <laughs> when you when you're not giving it your all. So, um, you know, he backed us a hundred percent. If we were giving everything, he coaches effort. You know, he's like skills aren't going to be up. Opposition is going to kick goals. You know, mistakes are going to be made on the ground. But all I want is your buy-in. I want you to take your turn. I want you to make tackles. I want you to win your own ball, and everything will take care of itself. So, you know, I guess I was fortunate in that that I knew how to be a contested player and yep. um, and that's what he liked about that's what he coaching liked. you yeah um, so yeah some some amazing mentors absolutely and was there any particular games that he sort of singled you out where you maybe weren't doing all the hard stuff or no nah, pretty good uh, I think he was it's pretty good like that I think um, very tactical I think he probably probably gave a couple of guys what they needed yeah. under the side, but I don't think he wanted to ever embarrass anyone. Like he's he's pretty pretty calculated. He he rode the kids really hard. Yep. Um, again, I'm probably lucky that I was in my mid twenties and probably established by the time Rossi got there. Yeah, because otherwise you've been on the blasting end. Of yeah, the like he was just so so tough on on the younger players that they knew what was expected. You know, to the you know, I think they needed it. Yep. You know, he wanted to fast track them, so we were so we were competitive, but. Yeah, I wouldn't allow to be a young bloke around. Definitely. Either, so. And then you've had so many like iconic teammates for that era of the Saints. So you mentioned Nick Rewalt, um, Steve Baker, Stephen Milne, the list goes on, Brett Goddard, all the all these guys that are absolute stars. Is there one that you really consider like your best teammate or it was a real privilege to play? You mentioned Nick Rewalt before. Yeah, all those all those guys. Um, you know Lee Montagna. Uh, you know, Did you live with Lee Montagna yeah, for a bit? Yeah. Yeah, so so Rue and, and Joey and I lived together for few years at the start um so we sh- we shared a really good bond and still today um you know they're both two of my best mates and have been through been through everything um but yeah we were privileged to, to be in an amazing era with you know Hamill and and Garrick and in the early days and then later on you know Michael Gardner was added who's a who's a champion of a guy and um you know Lenny and Bakes and Stevie Milne and Rue all these guys just Amazing team, mate. Superstars, yeah, for sure. And then 2009, the team starting to really build. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you uh, were in some prelims the years leading up to that. 2009, you get to the grand final. Tell us about that year. What made that year so special or different? And you know, what made that team so great um, to get so close? Yeah, I think oh eight, we limped into. It. Oh, I don't know if we limped, but we lost the prelim to the Hawks, who eventually went on to win it. Yep. Um, and then oh nine. Um, I reckon Rossi had a bit of a chat. We were all scratching our heads to to wonder how we could take a next step. And the the, the meeting was quite simple at the start of preseason. Rossi said, I, "I think everybody's got improvement in them. You know, even Rui's probably at the top of his game, and um, you know, Nick Dalsano and all these midfielders are probably almost there as as genuine stars." But he said. If we can, he changed our attitude towards training, and everybody's got. You know, Rui might have five percent. You know, and then someone like Andrew McQuaidhill that was sort of just starting out, mate. You've got sixty percent improvement. So together, if we all collectively try that little bit harder and change our attitude, training, and buy into the game plan, we can we can improve from a prelim side to a to a grand final contender. Um, that preseason was was pretty much based around that, and then you know you gain a bit of confidence uh, around your game plan and you gain confidence in your teammates that. They're doing what you ask them to do, and everybody's reciprocating. They're winning contested ball. We're making tackles. We're, you know, we're judging each other on a, um, a really solid, um, leadership model. Model. Yeah. You know, the standards make, are just set so high yeah. as well. I imagine, and, and it's then it's an amazing feeling, like it's a euphoric feeling. That I, I know, and we went out and won nine and straight, and it was just like wow. Yeah, you know, like it was without sounding arrogant. We were walking up the race, smiling at each other, like Collingwood are now a little bit, I yep. guess. You know, and and. Knowing that you don't want to say it, but you're like, are we going to be five or six goals up a quarter time? Yeah, like that's the attitude. That was the, that sort was of the momentum that yep. was building, and um, you know, playing in that that team of 09 was something really special. Absolutely. So then the 09, um, you fall just a little bit short with Geelong. How did you go with that game then? Was it sort of like was the team nervous, or why do you think that kind of maybe didn't roll your way? Is there anything you would have done a little bit differently with that one? No, uh, I think I think the stats show. I, I think it was. If you boil it down to the game, it was missed opportunity in front of goal. Yep. You know, we just didn't kick straight to nail it. You know, if we nailed our goals, we're probably four or five goals up a quarter time. And it was it was a brutal game. 
the 09 grand final. It was, um, you know, we'd played Geelong only once that year, both undefeated early in the year, probably the, the best home and away game I've played in. Um, so we sort of knew we were around the mark. We were going to dance pretty pretty closely, us and Geelong, and uh, it was wet. I remember to the grand final parade the day before was teeming rain. We had to sit in the in the ute. You're joking. <laughs> So you hey, man. Oh, mate, we want to sit up on we on the sit, roof. Give me the deck chairs on top. On the decky yeah. on the back of the ute, and just soak it all out. And it was that wet. We had to sit inside, oh. and poke your head out the window. Oh, get home, run. Oh, the worst. So, so it was wet. It was a wet weekend. The ground was heavy, so it just became a war of attrition. Mm-hmm. Like right from the first bounce, like the tackles with. I think it's probably been broken now, but at the time it was a record amount of tackles for both teams. Contested ball. <laughs> It was tough, it was hard, it was two, two brutally mature teams that knew what we what were doing. And um, in the end, you know, they, they just got, the, they got it done. We yep. went down by a kick and it was devastating. Absolutely. And um, that rivalry with Geelong all throughout that up here, that was pretty fierce. Yeah. Was there, who were you sort of matched up on during that time? Who was your battle? Well, I think the, the Geelong rivalry went right back from... Because th- their list came through like us. You know, the yep. Ablets and the Bartels and Cameron Ling and all these guys were sort of a s- similar age and they yep. were all started the same. So there was early 2000s and maybe a pre-season grand final and a couple of good battles. Um, and then we dropped off a little bit and then caught them again, 08, 9, 10. Um, so there was there was many rivals uh, and great battles. And towards the end, around the grand final, like, you know, Fraser had, had retired and I'd become a permanent forward. And um, I think... Throughout that era, player Matty Scarlett most or most times, um, who who was just extraordinary tough to play on. Yep. You know, for a guy of his, he's not a big man, he's not a tall bloke, but just so quick and smart and calculated. He was he was always tough to get a kick against. A star for sure. And then the next year, twenty ten, the famous drawn grand final against Collingwood. Tell us about that because that must have been such a weird experience to play in in a game that uh, that you drew. Yeah. And the grand final. Yeah, uh, clearly devastating at the time. But yeah. now looking back on it, you, you've got the, uh, get the benefit of probably appreciating what, what it was more than at the time. Yep. Um, and, and to say that I played in the drawn grand final is, is a great honour and a part of that team. And to be involved in that game, which is you know going to go down in history as the last draw and, and the enormity of it is, uh, is pretty cool. But, um, you know, 09, we, we lost the prelim, then we lost the granny. And it's like, bloody hell, how are we going to pick ourselves up again? Yep. Uh, to go to that next step, and uh, I think Ross tells the story, the, f- the famous story that maybe Octoberish uh, at the end of '09, he was in his office, probably you know, I think he says he's feeling a bit sorry for himself, how he's going to do it, and he sees a figure running up and down the wing at Moorabbin, you know, shirt off, middle of October, flogging himself, and he looks out and he goes, "This is Lenny Hayes." He goes, "Okay, if it's good enough for Lenny to be flogging himself and not feeling sorry for himself, I'm going to get going." Yep. Um, and that just sort of filtrated through the group. And we're like, we've still got the same team. We've still got a solid game plan. We're still going to be amongst it. Let's just let's sharpen up again, give ourselves the best chance. And, um, you know, top four side again, gave ourselves a really good opportunity. Ended up, I think we finished fourth, upset Geelong in the first final, missed a week, going to a prelim, all of a sudden found ourselves in a granny again. Um and the opportunity presented itself. Yeah, unreal. And then what was the feeling like, you know, in between with that week, trying to get up for that next game? Uh, for you personally, I know you said that, you know, that was like that, uh, the moment with Lenny Hayes and, and Ross going, all right, cool, let's, you know. Yeah, well, that was 12 months before. Oh, 12, sorry, that was the one, yeah. uh, that was 09. Yeah, yeah so that, that was sort of getting us up for that yep. that whole year. Um, well, you know, the, the drawn grand final, anyone that's watching can see, we threw the world at them. Yeah, and know, if that, there was another few minutes, probably yeah, they, they came. They came out of the block. They, they were the best team that year. No, no drama. Um, and they were on fire, top of the ladder. They come out um, and sort of took their opportunities. They were all over us at, at half time, mid twenties, twenty five, twenty six points down at quarter time. Um, you know, and we're probably staring at the defeated back to back, staring at back to back granny losses. And the mood was sort of, I can't. It was, it was a bit weird. You know, we could have really rolled our toes up and gone and made that. We could have got ugly, but um, the leaders of the group said, look, if if anybody doesn't believe we can't win this game, stay in the locker room. Do not run out with me. Yep. Um, and I think – and we're just going to take it minute by minute. I think the attitude just changed. And we went, okay, we're right amongst this. And we, we did. We took it minute by minute, clawed ourselves back in it. Um, you know, <laughs> Michael Gardner did his hammy just before halftime, which – sort of probably dampened the mood a little bit. 
we didn't take a second ruckman, so you know, I got the chance to play in the ruck, and I, I say that fondly because it got me into the game. Yep. Um, and I got to witness a few of these guns, Lenny Hayes diving on balls and willing us over the line, you know, like the landmines. And mate, he, had a, he had a perforated voice box or something like that. He got kicked in the voice box and just to keep going, he's a Norm Smith medalist that day. Yep. Um, and we just willed ourselves like moment by moment just to get up and ride amongst it. And, um, you know, BJ takes a hanger and puts us up with a couple of minutes to go. And we're like, this is actually this reality. Is like, we're, we're on. Um, you know, and then it, it unfolds and it's a draw. And the feeling of the draw is just something you can't it's just really so describe. Empty. It's just you know, like in your wildest dreams, you, you drive to the grand final that day, thinking you know, there's going to be a result. There's a result, right? Yeah. Every time, like, this is it. You're gonna you're gonna be standing on the podium, or you're gonna have lost it again, like one or the other. Um, and then for a draw, and it's like hundred thousand people on their seats, however many million watching it on TV, um, just throwing the absolute world at it left nothing in the tank and the siren goes, you can hear a pin drop in the MCG. And then I think it's like, okay, what do we do now? And then it crosses your mind and you think, that's a grand final, we're going to have to come back. Yep. Um, yeah, so the week started. Unreal. So then after that 2010, uh, 2011, Ross leaves, what was the effect like on you personally and on the group? And how did you kind of sort of see how things were going to be planned, uh, panning out rather uh, from that period? Yeah, the end of 10... Uh, well, eleven. We we went. We moved to Seaford, which ripped the ripped the heart out of the joint. Yeah. Um, as the players, and you know, we'd all grown up around Moorabbin and got pretty. It was a derelict old joint, but it was sort of home. Yep. Um, you know, and, and moving to a new facility was so kind of exciting. But to move us down to Seaford was a disaster. Yep. Uh, rip ripped the soul out of the place. You know, and, and just excuses, change the feel. Excuses, yep. whatever. But that's yep. what happened. Yep. You know, that's reality. Um, you know, and we're an aging group. Ross sort of uh, Ross was there in eleven. We played, you know, we we're making up the numbers really in the finals. Lost to Sydney in the first final, and then uh, and then he left um, at the end of eleven, and and Scotty Waters came in, and I, I think we'd realised that our our time was done, our our window was shut to play to contend for a grand final, and they needed to really rebuild after that. Um, so yeah, I, you could sort of see the end. I, I reckon we. As a group, we probably lamented in that for a little while. Yep. You know, we were probably stuck on losing two grand finals rather than it took, it took a while on. to move forward. Um, I think that was that was pretty obvious. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, towards the end of your career and retiring, was there a story that, like, was it for a milestone game or something like that at some point that you maybe weren't going to get up for a fit and you had to pass a fitness test or something like that and yeah. you didn't think you were going to quite get, get the numbers that you needed? Is there a story there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I knew it was going to thirteen was going to be my last year, and so was this was this your last game? Yeah, it, it was the last game. Yeah, so um, yeah, it was. I knew it was going to. Be, I was out of contract. I wasn't going to get another one. I was. I just wasn't up to it anymore. Yep. And, you know, Scotty had pretty much made it clear that that it was all over, and you know, I was I was comfortable. You don't want to finish, but it was going to happen. And I was on one hundred ninety nine games um, with about eight weeks to go, and. Scotty just get White. me that one more game. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Scotty Waters had a chat to me, and we're going to play. It was Carlton on the Monday night. For some reason, we played him on a Monday night there for a while, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to play her on Monday. Um, play two hundred, and then that's enough. I'll, I'll get bring one of the kids in, and I was happy with that. No problem. Bring one of the kids in and and play them and get eight games into them at the end of the year. Yep. And you know, I'll just I'll cruise off. Um, went out to train, and I was. I was pretty excited. I was like a dog with two dicks and <laughs> jumping around. And I twing my I, I twing my calf. Oh, no. I think like with three days to go before Carlton, and I walked into Scott's office and he's like, "What's going on?" I said, "Dummy calf." And he's like, "Okay, no worries. Like we've still got eight weeks. Just go off and, and get it ready and and whatever. Do your best." And I did, but I just kept nicking it. Yep. Like old man industry uh, injury. Um, I was just. Trying to stay fit, I think I came back and played a couple in the twos at Sandy and was around the mark, and but it was still sore. It was giving me a heap of grief. And once they start going the calves, oh, that's yeah, uh, cooked. Yeah, yeah. It cooked. So it got to the last round. I think I played in the twos, but my calf was still sore. Um, and I don't think he was going to play me. You know that even if I proved my fitness or whatever, and um, you know. I think he got lent on pretty hard by, by some senior guys or whatever. Just, you know, it was a dead rubber. Just Frio in, yeah. was on top. Yep. We were on the bottom. Didn't mean anything, you know, whatever. Um, and there was four GPSs <laughs> for the whole squad. Not everyone wore one. 
And so my calf saw the last session before the game and I snuck into the physio's office with when no one was around. I said, Look, I'm in a bit of trouble here. So he strapped it up like a mummy, like the yeah. <laughs> round there, up the back and up there. And I pulled my socks up so no one well, probably wore tights, it was hot, whatever, yeah. just to cover it. Um, you know, I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm walking out to training and the sports science bloke just comes over to me with the GPS and I said, you're fucking kidding, mate. <laughs> so not everybody goes, there's four. four. Yeah. Four blokes. And like, he made me wear one to see if I was fit enough to <sighs> play. And I'm like, I'm going to have to run five or six Ks or whatever you had to do at training and yep. high intensity. There's no way the car's getting through I'm that. Like, yeah. There's no way I'm doing that. Um, so, you know, desperate people get desperate. <laughs> and we went around and did the lap and Joey, Joey Montagna was, was stretching on the fence and I said, how you feeling, mate? And he goes, good. And I said, good because you're wearing this. <laughs> so I pulled it out and shoved it in Joey's jumper and... Don't go too hard because they're going to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Joey's <laughs> flying around. <laughs> you know, top speed of 32 Ks. Oh, cuz, you killed yeah. it today. So, um, <laughs> you know, he, he cruised through and I just pretended to look busy and stretched for a while at the back of the, back of the line and <laughs> That's pulled unreal. it out and gave it in, gave it in and um, ended up getting the go. Amazing, amazing. I don't, I don't know if they knew or not. I haven't really spoken <laughs> to them. But Great story, anyway. though. <laughs> All right, so Justin, a big part of the uh, podcast is talking about uh, your like habits and talking everything performance throughout your career. So let's start off with like the actual physical training side of stuff. Uh, what were some of like the you know habits that you were doing whilst you were playing in terms of recovering, um, you know, sharpening up skills? Was there any points in your career that you know you got told you really had to work on something? And what did you do? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I had a lot of I had a lot of injuries, so I can honestly say that I. There was nothing I didn't try. Yep. You know, and there's heard it early in my career that the um, the the program that you get is a bare minimum. Yep. You know, anything anything above and beyond is going to help you yep. or improve you and, and whatever. So, you know, I think there's nothing that I didn't try outside massage and shiatsu, whatever, something, um, float tanks, hyperbaric chambers. Did everything, yep. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a good go at it. Great. Um, so I sort of learnt that. You know what? What was the the program was going to hold me in good stead? Yep. But it wasn't going to be enough to and, and a and a body like mine that was you know prone to fail. Yep. Um, with collision injuries and whatever, I, I needed to to find something else to heal. It, Absolutely. So. And was there anybody that kind of like really showed you how to do that? Like, was there anyone that you modelled yourself off for um, at the club? We, we had some great some great leaders and mentors. Like Rob Harvey was the ultimate preparer. Yep. Um, Hamill coming from Carlton that era, like he was just. I think he's probably the one that instilled that the the programs a bare minimum. Like yep. he'd come off the track and Sammy, Sammy would be doing half an hour planks after the game, <laughs> after the training or whatever. Or, or he'd con- sometimes that you'd, you'd be walking off after training. Like where are you going? Yeah, oh, have a shower. He goes, no, you're not. And he'd throw ten more balls to you and smash you. Or yep. Like or just you know, you're not playing with me until you can be competitive. So that was probably um, the first eye opener that you had to probably go a bit harder. And and I get it later on. When the science came into it and loads and bearing and all yep. the whatever, that bullshit, you know, don't kick too many, have too many shots of goals because you break your calf or you break your whatever. Hips, yeah. Um, it got harder to do that, overtrain. Yep. Um, but they're, they're so finely tuned now, as you know. Yes. That there's not a lot of room for that. But there's always room for recovery and improvement. And, for um, sure. And I probably only l- – I learned it l- really late that the mental side of it yep. um, was so important. You know, mindfulness and meditation and – um, and those sort of things. That that's a real regret of mine that I didn't tap into that early. Like, and you've heard it a million yeah. times, haven't you? Mm. Uh, well, ninety percent of the games played above the shoulders. You're like bullshit. Yeah. When you're a young you're a kid, it's like I'm just going to be fitter, faster, stronger. Uh, I'm going to train harder, and I'll eventually get what I need. But it really is played above the shoulders, and not tapping that until later. Like I can remember, it was in Ross's era, and Sean Richardson was the first real introduction to a sports psychologist, and, and he was instrument, and he's back at the club now. Um, really instrumental in building a, a culture and a leadership pattern and uh, holding guys accountable and, and really structuring how we went about it. You know, but he's, he had a psych background. He was our, our psychologist. And lean period or whatever was going on, I was encouraged to go talk to him. And I'm like, you know, and, and that's the thing that, you know, as a man and what we're seeing, and, and we'll get to it in the, the work that I'm doing now, yeah. but you, you wear a mask, right? You don't want to be seen as weak because you're going to lose the respect of your teammates and your coaches and fans and whatever. But, and I'm like, no, I'm not seeing a psychologist. I don't, I don't need that. 
And I can remember the first interaction. We go into a room and and he s- sits me in a chair and, you know, sit down and put your feet on the ground and I want you to just to feel your feet on the ground and I want you to start breathing. I'm like, fuck off, mate. Yeah. Just tell me how to smack into a pack and do this and kick longer and whatever. I like, yep. just didn't get it. Um, so that was my first real introduction of being in the moment and looking after your mind outside the game and and, and it came late in my career. Yep. Um, Which I think it does. It's just sort of just the stage that you're at. Like you said, yeah. it's just the developmental thing of where you are, you know, in yeah. your own head and developing and your experiences and that sort of thing. It sort of pushes you this way and that way to work on different things, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so so he, was, he was a big influence later on and got me through, I think, a lot, a lot of performance anxiety and anxiety around injuries and yep. self-doubt like that allowed me to keep going. For, for a few more years after some some pretty big injuries. For sure. And then some of that uh, that you just touched on there, I mean, the anxiety, performance anxiety when it comes to professional sport, again, what people don't understand, it's so much, you know, about in your head, not just looking after your physical body. What were some of the things that you were doing with, like, the exercises and, and actual techniques that you were working on throughout that back end when you started to really get into it? Um, I, I think I'd learnt just to be present and you know really focusing on what you're doing in the moment whether it was a bench press or training or whatever it was but I learned how to have time away from the club as well just to decompress and not be consumed by it Um, because going through like a a really couple of really low periods you 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 find yourself sort of over stewing things um, and carrying that into a game which wasn't allowing you to be present and you know being in the moment and you'd be worried about your performance. You'd be halfway through the first quarter, and be like, oh, I haven't touched the ball. Yep. Or and then you're in your head, and, and then it just spirals. And then yep. The whole game sort of gone before you. But if you look back on it, you're having those thoughts halfway through the first quarter. There was still a lot of time to change it and be in the present. Yep. Um, do you think a lot of that stuff is now crossed? We'll get into it a little bit later. Do you reckon it's crossed over a lot? All that stuff that you've learned from football in terms of being with the in the moment, not letting yourself spiral, all that you know, good positive yeah. self talk with all the work you're doing now, and then I guess later on when you had other you know men- mental health issues that you were trying to work through. Yeah, like it, it's a life lesson, right? Like, yeah. and and it it did it helped me cope with with stuff like you know I got knocked out absolute ripper 2006 and I didn't understand anxiety or performance anxiety before that like yep. I was as, I, as we've said I was a country kid took things in my stride really nothing overawed me um, didn't understand real low mood or or anxiety but after that was um, after that that injury and that accident you know I, I went to some pretty dark places straight away and you know I, what you say, and it was a highlight of what you can say to someone really sticks in their mind, good or bad. Mm. And I can remember, you know, waking up in hospital after that and being there for a few days in a dark room. And the neurologist said, mate, you're doing well. Because I think I was talking and walking. Um, I said, you're doing really well. Like, you, you really could have been, this really could have been a disaster. Um, and that incident you're talking about, that was the Gian Syracuse yeah, one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like a, like a fluid leak out my ear and uh, eardrum and, and whatever. And, you know, not understanding the enormity of that at the time. And, and the doc said, you know, like you're really close to being in a wheelchair. If not, you know, something wow. bad could happen. And that stuck in my mind. Yeah. You know, and the, the feeling of the concussive symptoms after that, the dizziness and the, the memory loss and the not really feeling up to, like getting dizzy running a lap or, mm. you know, not being able to concentrate. And then that knowing what could have happened um, really played on me to get back out on the ground. And coming back at the end of that year to play the last – I can't even remember, maybe the last couple of rounds and a couple of finals, maybe one final, was a horrendous experience. Like mm. the anxiety to do that. Like I wasn't one bit in the present. It was running up the race, not even thinking about how am I going to get a kick or what's my role on the team or are we gonna, how are we going to win the game. It was will I walk off this ground or not? Mm. You know, I was that close before. And because you're in that anxious, like the anxiety yeah. can take over and you're not, wasn't fit. Like it just wasn't fit because it hadn't allowed to, to do the work. Um, you, 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 it's a lonely place being not fit on, on an AFL footy ground. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, it really took over. Definitely. So then on the concussions, so there was obviously that one really big incident that you just spoke about with um, John Syracuse, which was just an awful, like, oh, just, yeah, just everything was horrible about that. Was there other times throughout your career that you also got concussions as well? Yeah, so Any after other that, ones? I found that, it was really easy to, to get concussive symptoms after yeah. that. It was, um, and is that pretty common if you've had one really bad incident? Well, I think so. That's yeah. my experience. Yeah. Um, you know, and after that, it, it didn't have to be 
knocked out per se or yep. like on the ground and convulsing like a, a proper um, you've been knocked out but uh, just a heavy tackle or a go up for the mark and a glance on the chin whatever my eyes would go blurry and a deja yeah. vu and you know be, be all over the place and to the point where it was it wasn't a great place to be and yep. then that'd play in your mind for the next week and the next week and, and it sort of built up but just small knocks would rattle me really easy for the rest of my career. Yeah, crazy. So then did that kind of play a part in you retiring when you did as well? Was the concussions or not really? Or was uh, more the physical body and just you were just knew when you were yeah, done? Yeah, look, I was, I was, I'd run my race. Yeah. I think like it had taken a toll on its body, certainly the concussion stuff. Um, but, you know, I was pretty beat up and I was nearly 31. So yeah. I'd, I'd, had a, I'd had pushed it as far as I could, um, you know, and, and that was – looking back on it, I would have – I think now with a calculated – with more of a, a calculated or knowing what the concussion was going to end up like yep. and deteriorate over time, I think I probably would have – or I hope I would have had the courage to pull up earlier yep. um, and not push it for so far. Yep. Um, but at the time, you, you just want to milk it and you want to go as long as you can. And, of course. Um, you know, devastated to, to finish up. And then coming out of, you know, your AFL career, what was that period like for you personally when, um, you know, you just finished football um, and, you know, in terms of your own men- mental health uh, journey? Um, yeah, so I'd probably, I'd already experienced really low mental health after after that time. Yep. Um, and then... What year was that again? It was 2006 when I got knocked Six, out. Yeah. And then 13 when I retired. Yep. Um, and then... And I think every athlete, every professional athlete, footballer, whatever, goes through this, oh, my God, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? I'm 30 years old, but I feel like my life's over and you've been a part of structure and yep. a real purpose this whole time. And um, all of a sudden, you're 30, your income's going to be cut by eight, whatever yep. it is. Um, I've got a mortgage, a wife and two young kids. How, what am I going to do? So I think that um, would cause anyone some, some sort of stress. So there's... There's a bit of a period where you stumble around and I hadn't put much thought into life after footy because at the time you think it's going to go forever and you're going to be okay and you're going to be yep. set up. So it was a real, real stumbling period for a long time. Yeah, for sure. And um, then in terms of like you reaching out and then getting a little bit of help, when did that sort of start with you? And feel free to obviously share as, as much as you want for it. Yeah. Um, but I imagine there would have been some really difficult times for you around that and you know, just sort of share your experience, what that was like. Yeah, I think it, you know, and society is becoming better at it now. They're mm. taking the mask off of being totally different scene to you know ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it was, it was almost you felt shame and guilt in asking for help for your mental state, um, you know, and and you didn't want to lose respect or you didn't want to be seen as weak or, or whatever. So you battle through, right? And you, and while everything's going a train wreck around you, you know, like your decision making and and whatever your mood and your ups and downs, you're not flying and you. You're worrying about a family and, you know, all these stresses. So it took me a long time to open up. And I think I applaud these days the courage of the players and the clubs to back people that are going through mental tough times. So I'm not sure, but for me, the significant thing was around 2015 or 16, Buddy Franklin had the courage on the eve of the final series, the best marquee player for the Swans. He had the courage to put his hand up and say, you know, I'm not travelling real well. Um, and the Swans having the courage to back him and say, okay, we're going to treat this as a serious injury, which totally it should be, um, and say so you need to step away from the game and go and work on yourself for your longevity. You know, we're, I know we've got a final series and potentially a grand final to win, but as a person, we need to support you as a person and treat it like a six-week hamstring injury or whatever it takes for you to go away and, and get yourself right. So I think that, that the floodgates opened a little bit then and yep. other AFL players and even society was okay. This is okay. Just to had do. D- different sort of um, yeah. This just is broke okay that stigma to, a little bit of it. Actually, yeah. come and, and seek help and take the mask off and you know and and drop my maladaptive behaviours and my my behaviours that are helping me disassociate with where I am and um, you know just cope. And I do you guess. think the concussions were really you know linked to you getting into that state? I've no it, doubt because yeah. I, as I said, I, I don't think I, I didn't feel anything before that. Yep. and probably didn't. You know, straight after it was a hard period, and but didn't associate that with it. You yep. know, until later on. You know, until we were a bit more educated around it and what was going on. You can join the dots, and okay, that's what was happening. Yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, that definitely has has a big part to play. Do you reckon you would have pulled up? You said it before. Do you reckon you would have pulled up a little bit shorter if you sort of knew what maybe the outcome could have been post yeah, well, I post think, I think now knowing, um, you know, that, that CTE is a thing and yep. um, knowing that it's degenerative and um, what I've felt in the last few years and what, what was coming, I think, uh, as I said before, I don't know if I would have had the courage to stop yep. then. Um, but I would have liked to think I would have gone, okay, this Absolutely. is no good for, for future. And um, you're doing so. some amazing work uh, now down at the Danny Frawley Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that you're doing down there, um, the work that the foundation's doing and, and everything surrounding that? Amazing, amazing organisation, um, you know, and, and I, I sort of get the honour of, of carrying on Danny Frawley's legacy, um, you know, and it's tragic that, that his life had to end for something to – to uh to to be built like this but yep. but he really started it you know Danny was open about his mental health struggles and his mental breakdown and the stresses that playing and coaching had on him um and I think he was in discussions with the club that that that, that, that was going to happen um down the track and you know losing his life to suicide was the catalyst for them to get into gear and really build something. And, and his wife, Anita, and his daughters were, were really big in that. And Matt Finnis at the time, the CEO, and they said, Let, let's build this centre and have a really big purpose. And you know, I'd had my battles that were well known within the club and yep. a couple of great mates knew that I wasn't going that well. And the opportunity for lived experience to come back and be a part of this um, was something that I couldn't refuse and... And, you know, I just had to, had to do it and had to be a part of it to carry his legacy on. Absolutely. And we were speaking a little bit before we started about some of the things that, you know, you actually are doing sort of day to day as part of uh, your role. What are the sort of things that, you know, you're getting some of, um, you know, the clients and, and people that you're working with to do, whether it's, you know, exercises, um, whether it's, you know, anything like that? So it's a, a fraud. we're not a centre for crisis. Yep. So if you're a crisis state and you need immediate help, it's not a place for that. Yep. Um, you know, we're not a we're not a bed facility. We're not a, a medical facility. But it's all around the term we use is mental fitness, um, and it's learning and adapting your lifestyle to when maybe things go wrong. You know, when you have an adversity. So to to build resilience, you need adversity along the way to get back and and be resilient. So identifying those things, and and especially men. You know, I know it's the broad, um, but I understand and I can speak to men middle-aged men any men for that reason that we wear a mask and that we carry all the everyone carries a bag of shit mm. right and it's your ability to empty it um learn and how to you know be resilient after it and and all varying things like it could be kids stress wife stress or partner stress um you know a mortgage job like everybody's so got stuff going yeah. on in their life right um and then to the other scale, it might be a tragedy. You might lose somebody really close to you or you, you might have some sort of debilitating accident or whatever it is to cause that depressive state. Um, it's just, I think, educating people on how to manage that and how to identify it early so it doesn't turn into crisis. So the things you can do for yourself is, you know, get psychological help, use your body to move, um, eat healthy, drink plenty of water, like just basic life skills that, that probably get thrown out the window in the in a very busy um, era and community and society and stage of life that we're at. So absolutely, um, we, we, we educate everybody from teenage kids to, to local footy clubs and, and speak about that, it's, you know, identifying maladaptive behaviours in your mates um, and, and asking them, giving them a genuine, safe, authentic space to be able to, to open up and seek help. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, sort of uh, personal experience of mine in about December, I sort of started going through some um, mental health stuff myself. And, you know, with all the stuff that I do on Instagram and, you know, the videos and you're putting out there and like you said, you're wearing this bit of a mask and, you know, you're putting out all the highlights of stuff. But I was actually feeling, you know, super terrible about all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And Well, that's Instagram in yeah. a nutshell, right? Yeah, that's right. Like, yeah. And, well, it's not, and it's not like being inauthentic. It was just like, you know, it was more that, um, you know, you – you're putting your regular stuff up and you're like, oh, that's yeah. Like, but that's the thing that kids and, and yeah. probably everybody don't understand about social media. And that's that's a huge challenge that we've got in this era is that, you know, body shaming for teenage girls or um, comparisons are big things. So if you sit there and scroll and scroll, you, you're looking you're for a dopamine find, you're gonna hit, right? definitely you're, find something that's better than. You're yeah. looking for a quick dopamine hit, but then all of a sudden you go and you scroll and you scroll and someone's going, I've got a new car or I'm at a fancy restaurant or I'm at the beach or everybody posts the good stuff. Yeah. 
right? And then, then, then you get off it and you feel flat about yourself. Well, why is my life like that? They like, don't understand that that's a snippet. That's 30 seconds of their day. Absolutely. You know, and that's it, it's just all, all brought up in lights. So I think the education around that needs to be bigger. Definitely. Um, and it's uh, on parents as leaders, uh, anybody in the community, to help the kids understand this, or even adults. Like, yep. you know, you find yourself going, scroll, scroll, scroll. I'm not getting what I need out of this. I'm looking Absolutely. for a quick dopamine hit. I'm looking for a like. I'm looking for, for whatever it is. It's not coming. And all you're doing is going, why is my life a piece of shit when everyone else is so good? But reality yep. is that it's not. Yep. So it's it's a very it's a very dangerous tool. But I understand the the great tool it is yes. as well. Yes, oh, but, but what I'm going to say with on that was that the, the bit that it really sort of turned for me and because uh, that whole time it was more that I just didn't want to talk. I was talking to, you know, I've got great supporting family. It's a way to communicate, right? Yeah, that's right. So like, you know, I was talking to them about stuff and whatever um, But the and whilst doing all little bits like talking to a psychologist and just changing some of the little habits like I, like I had um, that, that needed fixing, like, you know, not scrolling on the phone as much, yeah. um, making sure I was, you know, training all the time, making sure the food's on, just all these little things um, that were stacking up and starting to feel a little bit better. But the thing that made, I think, the best for me, the best result was actually share, sharing the experience and actually just identifying, just going, yep, cool, I'm actually not feeling all right now. And once I sort of got that off my chest, oh, my gosh, I could uh, the improvement yeah. that I got so quickly from just sharing that yeah. was amazing. Yep. And, and, and some of the great stuff you can learn from it. Yeah. You know, like it's it's posed, like there's a lot of positive stuff in there. And, yeah. you know, the Google matrix, like they clearly know what we're thinking about and what we're scrolling and what we're clicking on. So whatever mindset you're in, it's going to really magnify what's going on because that feed's just going to keep coming up and coming up. So yeah. you've got to learn identifying that and go, hang on a bit. What's, what's doing me good now or what's not? Absolutely. You know, and helping identify what's not and – being able to eradicate it out of your life and go on a different path. Absolutely. So, uh, so that role for you, what's that hope? What are you hoping to develop into it? What's the next sort of stages for? Is there a vision for the next, you know, stage for the Danny Frawley and yourself? Yeah, uh, a, a big part of my role there is connecting past players. Yep. Um, and not only St Kilda from from any era. Uh, so Danny's Danny's legacy is that well, he wanted somewhere to, for past players to connect and you know be able to voice what they're going through and have some sort of facility for them to work on their mental and physical fitness. Uh, so a big part of my role is to connect with all these past players, which is, it's amazing. Yeah, I you bet. Know, like, um, you know, a guy like Brian Gleeson, who was a, won a Brownlow medal for the Saints in the 50s, you know, he pops in for a coffee, you know, and awesome. and, and, and just gets stuff off his chest and has a, has a, says g'day and... I'd n- never met him before twelve months ago, and he's a legend of the game, legend of the club, and you, you've got something in common because you wore that, you wore the same colours. So, um, you know that's just one. But there's a, there's a lot of guys and girls that get get out of elite sport that go through some really tough times and and don't have the tools or the know how how to navigate through it. So that's a big part of what we do. Um, as I said, we've got a mental fitness platform that we deliver to local clubs, uh, schools, this whole stuff, and that's all around. You know, it's basically around being present. You know, forty-seven percent of your time, any human spends forty. Every, any human spends uh, whatever the stats are forty. A big chunk in yep. the past or the future. You know, the future is anxiety. The past is depression. Simply, um, so to be able to you know connect back into the moment and be what they're and be present at what they're doing. Uh, there's a lot around our education. Absolutely. And then in terms of like, you know, the uh, post-concussion uh, symptoms and all that sort of thing, and you're looking at how, um, you know, the rules have changed, are you happy that those rules are now being in place and that's a real positive thing for the players? Yeah, it is. And that, the connection to Danny Frawley yep. um, for me was pretty significant because, you know, this, this CTE is only been able to be diagnosed post-mortem. Yep. Um, you know, and Anita Frawley is really big on it and, you know, I noticed the changes in Danny um, and – and what he went through and a lot of those things that she talks about, I see. Um, so that that was the initial connection. And, you know, concussion is – it's a huge part of people's livelihood and well-being. Maybe not at the time, but because it's degenerative. Yep. Um, you know, to be able to educate and understand what that's going to be like. And I just pray and hope that we can – you know, the doctors and scientists and the people in charge of this sort of stuff can – 
have some sort of resolution and better ways to manage it going forward. Absolutely. Well, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure hearing all the fantastic stories from your career. Uh, actually unreal. And then all the amazing work that you're doing now with the Danny Frawley Foundation and hope it, you know, continues to grow uh, and, um, you know, reach lots of people. And, you know, if you ever need any hand with anything, getting the message out for anything, always sort of really happy to help. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. No worries, mate. And thank you for all the good work you're doing. And, um, it's a pleasure to meet. We touch base over Instagram. Yes, so there yes, you go. There you go. Look, it's, it's not all bad. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, it's it's a great connecting tool, but well done on what you're doing and that's really good to see. Too good. Thank you, my friend.